Hi all. Oh, hello, hello, hi all. <clears throat> this is the first time I'm uh, doing a live stream on my channel. Um, sorry, my voice is a bit gone because uh, I've had a really crazy long day. But I just want to hang out for about 45 minutes and just see if, well, um, anyone on my channel would be well, my stream is pretty unstable as well. Um, now I just need to check to see if the stream is stable. Um, so let's see. Now I think we're pushing far too many. Dropping 87%. Oh, that's not good. Okay, I'm going to. Sorry, guys, there's some technical difficulties. I'm going to be trigger some settings. I'll be back in, in a couple seconds, right? Hang on. Bear with me. Sorry about that. Let's see. Okay, 3000. 10% drop. Okay. Right, guys, I'm back. So I just had to tweak stream quality and right drop frames are dropping to around two percent right that's really good so welcome um i hope if, if you're joining the stream just feel free to comment in the live chat and say hi um let me know where you're from and it also would be cool if you could let me know um what brings you back to my channel or if you're a first time here and you've uh, just seen a few of my videos, uh, which ones catch your fancy? Because, um, sorry. one moment, one moment, oh boy. Because, oh, oh yeah, because it's because the way my channel started out is simply my sharing my passion with uh, the world, essentially. So I'm into quite a few things. I have varied interests and hobbies and stuff. Um, what? My phone is going to add. And then, yeah, so my channel doesn't have a particular direction like most channels essentially. But what's really cool is just to digress a wee bit. Um, so as of, I think about a week ago, um, YouTube made a large change, right? They're basically killing all the small channels. And I honestly thought, as I heard the news come up, that my channel's pretty much dead in terms of the monetization because even though a lot of my videos may not be done to a very, very high quality, there is uh, some info in, I think, on my watches, you know, like the stuff with my paddocks, uh, APs, and I have actually got a lot of awesome content coming through because uh, I was in Singapore for my 35th birthday. And, um, yeah, I, I was able to spend the whole morning at, uh, what's called Geneva Master Time, which is the service center uh, for Paddock in Singapore. And yeah, it is, it is pretty amazing because just to come back to that point, um, I gave my watch for service in June 2017, right? Uh, I, have, I had my 5146 annual calendar for five years and it was time for me to get a service. And as a f the, the comment I got a few days ago, he was a, a gentleman was asking, so how do you know when to give your watch for service? So 
Fanatec or any other brand would generally give you a guideline. Uh, with Fanatec, as in the animal calendars, your general guideline is three to five years, and they encourage um, collectors to service it in that period, right? Now, I took a bit more of a pragmatic approach, and it does fall within that window because I noticed after the first three years, um, the deviation uh, of the accuracy of the watch was getting worse. So it was it was it was not a big issue at like the three plus years, but as it got to the fifth year, it was accumulating at a faster rate, given the fact that it's an animal calendar and you keep it a winder and you keep it going, right? Keep it going for a whole year. As the months progress, you find that it's either losing or gaining time. In my case, it was losing. And so it's not a big issue because you can just pull the crown out and advance the, uh, what do you call, minute hand. And that's what I did for a while. Um, and so yeah, and, and just talk, talk, touching on that point, having spoken to various collectors, some either stick to what the manufacturers recommend, or I would say the more pragmatic approach is to just see how uh, your watch is doing. It's kind of like you, know, you have your car and you get your check engine light, right? Some people will sit check engine light and go a beeline to the garage, or you'll kind of ignore the check engine light and you'll wait till your car come, comes to a full halt, right? So that's the, the basic premise between this. Um, and um, yeah, uh, but my point is, I wouldn't uh, keep my watch going for more than five years though, because the whole point is it's an animal calendar movement. It's got a lot of delicate components, like well over three hundred something parts. The the danger that you're going to face is if you keep running it and it's you keep a, you know you you don't mind that it's losing time or whatever by advancing manually. Let's just say you want to be a cheapskate. You don't want to pay the service costs. What you're essentially doing is, it's like you're running your car engine without changing the oil. Okay, what's going to happen? Uh, the piston heads in the car are just going to keep rubbing against the chamber and that oil is just going to get gunked up and gunked up and turn black. And the same thing happens inside watches. Um, if you look at the, the pictures of watches that go for a service, most of this stuff in the moment, even though we, to us, by the eye, it's a see through to the sapphire back. If you put the liquid under a microscope, I'm pretty sure you'll be seeing loads of metal particles in there. And that's why you really would want to protect your investment, essentially, because let's assume you've, you know, miss, well, you're, you're mishandling your movement, but you're keeping for six, seven, eight years and keeping running, um, and it goes to product, they may not end up charging the normal search fee because they'll find there's a lot more wear and tear. And so basically, if you had to say pay an X amount, you might end up paying three times because they had to replace a lot of components. So I would wager that it's, it makes more sense to do it in five years. Pay the, pay the price because pay, pay, the, pay to play, right, it's fair enough. And then you know that for the next five years, it's gonna run again, it's not gonna have issues, and you're not wearing out components unnecessarily so. so that's just uh, my take on the servicing period uh, and the approach to servicing watches in general and I can I can actually attest to AP Audio PKA because to be honest I have a very deep love for AP um, and and the, the thing with AP watches it's like I would say that the service center in, in Singapore particularly is amazing. Um, I have been going there for a long time. I've also been going to Geneva, but this, the way AP is handled in Singapore alone, uh, the staff are incredibly friendly. They they are on the ball. 
emails come, you know, snap, snap. Um, I basically remember giving one watch and yeah, they, they came back so quickly and they serviced it in less than four or five months, which is a pretty quick turnaround. And uh, even for Padek, I was really surprised because I dropped off my annual calendar in June and I thought it'll be well over six months or even eight months. But it was it was ready by December. Um, that was very quick, and I even instructed in your must time to send it to Switzerland um, to to the manufacturer in Plan Le uh, They did that so because again with the paddock annual calendars, you need to have a particular tier of watchmaker. As I recall, it's watchmaker level two or three, and they need like. A minimum of 20 years experience um, to service that watch so they can't give a junior technician like those in the single service center because those techs aren't I won't call them watch makers really they're more techs technicians so they are trained to accept a watch give it a quick clean inspection troubleshoot um, troubleshoot any potential issues and it's not like if you if you know anything about IT or help desk, you have the you know let's, let's make let's make it simpler. Let's say you most people own Apple devices, right? So you may have called Apple support and you're like, hey, my phone's not working. The first person who picks up the phone is, is usually what's called the level one tech, and they their knowledge experience is pretty limited, but that's part of their job as well because they don't need to have a deeper understanding. They need to have more of a general and uh, widespread understanding. But their job is more to intercept your call and, oh, hey, beauty of sin, you're, you're the wonderful chap who's been asking some awesome questions. Um, actually, I just need to go back and see what you asked me today. I'm sorry, I didn't have time to reply. Um, let me find your comments. One moment. Oh yes, you asked me, right, what the, the, the deviation was um, when I gave my watch for service, right? So hang on, I'm just going to find my email, no, not my email, I prepared, so when I gave my watch for service, what I did was I prepared a letter, I always do that, it's AP or Paddock, I do a full letter, I it's a professionally done letter in the sense it's addressed to a particular person, it has details of my watch as the subject line. And then I will basically lay, lay it down in terms of why I'm giving my watch for service. So, one moment. I'm pulling out my Google Drive. Let's see, I'm trying to find the letter I sent for servicing. So, I, unfortunately, if I don't find it right now. Mm. Service. Hang on. I'm going, Google, I'm going to my Google Drive. Oh, here we go. Service letter June 2017. Beautiful. Google Drive is beautiful. Here we go. So, my letter says, Servicing on my party, Philippe. 546 years is on the moment. Yeah. By Geneva Master Time. To be sent to Paddock Salon in Geneva. Uh, manufacturing plan of the Full service. Kind of note. These are all the details. And so I have said, I. Oh, da, 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 da. The movement hasn't stopped once since the date of purchase. I wanted to make adjustments and corrections on the Feb March date transition. From the date of purchase, if you refer to the photograph on the left, the power reserve indicator has always had a malfunction. Uh, notice how the indicator is horizontal, pointing towards 9 o'clock, rather than pointing towards a plus sign. Um, the issue was brought to my attention during a previous visit of my department in Singapore, etc., etc. With regards to the service, we have to I have the uh, so deviation time. Da, 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 da. Right, no, I hadn't mentioned that particularly. But I remember it's like, it, it's, it's hard to recall, but over a course of maybe two or three months, it would accumulate uh, a, a five, um, yeah, a five minute maybe uh, slow down, right? So, well, I didn't need to because it's it's a very minor thing, right? So the, the mechanism behind the needle 
on power reserve. Uh, there's basically, it's, it's a cam. What a cam is, it's like a cog with a flat side. It's just that the, the technician hadn't positioned the stopping point correctly. So, the whole, so what happens is, if the scale is like this, let's say, this is the plus side, my right hand is plus, and this is negative. Um, the needle would just go like that. So meaning, I know this means plus, so if, if it's getting empty, it'll never go there, it'll only be here. So it'll only go this range. So all they have to do is correct it to start at the angle here, and then be that way. So it's a very minor adjustment. It's not like the whole watch is not going to work. And yeah, it, it worked fine for five whole years. It kept time perfectly. Um, the moon phase worked beautifully. I never had an issue with the the date aperture. It always transitioned the way it transitions uh, on on a palette. Um, and yes, I mean, if, if it really bothers you and you have the whole, I mean, I have OCD, but with this, I was like. The thing is, on, on, I've been on various forums and I've heard of Alec having QC issues. So just to give you a story, um, what was the time duration when you sent it to service? Um, so I would say between every two months or so, it would, two to three months, it would accumulate about five, uh, set, mm, yeah, about two to four minutes of slowdown across two to three months. That's roughly what I recall. Um, and again, I'm I'm not the sort of person who, at this stage, um, checks and keeps a record of deviation and all that. Um, when I was starting out with watches, I did that a lot with my Omega watches at the very start. But with work and stuff, I just don't have time to do that. I just appreciate the watch for what it is as a complicated art piece kind of thing on my wrist, not so much as a fine, accurate instrument. Although right now, I would wager it is. And you do all. wonder why I'm using the word wager. Um, it's because I got it from service and I instructed Geneva not to do any deep polishing. So deep polishing means, the technical term is case refinishing, right? Uh, case refinishing means they're going to take pretty abrasive um, approaches to to polishing the metal and in my case it's rose it's yellow gold right and what happens when you do case refinishing any sharp edges like a 90 degree you know a square bend so if I were to take a ruler here and like okay. I don't have anything flat so I'm gonna be very sure I'm gonna pull up my my, my oops that's not work is it? Oh sorry bear with me yeah so let's just take let's see you take this ruler right and you hold that, that that's a 90 degree bend so there's basically a very obvious cut here right when you sh do a polishing on that you start to smoothen out the edges that's why when you look at watches in, in auction houses you know um pudding key or all these uh, antiquorum or even uh, oral backs all the stuff that they, they talk about some of these watches are polished to, to near inch of depth and you can if you have the eye for it you can spot straight away that it has been abused um, by polishing just to try and set it for high value. Um, and to me, I want the watch to keep its character. I don't want it to be polished like that. I'll always keep it the way it is. But what I told them was to do a light polish. So light polish is you can, you can get these special cloths and I'm sure Parik has theirs. Um, they probably make their own. Uh, which is more or less called a jewelry cloth. And you can just lightly polish the watch and it takes a very minimal layer uh, of metal off. And what I got back was a very, very shiny watch, basically. Um, so honestly, I have no need to do case refinishing. Refinishing also may become a, a question if let's say you damage your watch. Like, let's say you're walking somewhere and it gets bumped into a doorknob, um, that would happen. Right, so so there, so there are a couple of ways to go about that. That's a really good question. Thanks for asking that. Power plant, HD, it's a brilliant question. So I have a couple of approaches to this, right? There are two ways to, well, there are a couple of ways. Let, let me tell you the way I do it. First of all, when I'm traveling, 
I travel as a professional businessman. What that means is I am dressed in my best suit. So I'm wearing my cashmere suit, I'm wearing my full um, what we call French cuffs, I'm going as if I'm going to a dinner with my best mates kind of thing, right? I've got my paddock on, I've got my paddock cufflinks on, and when you go through, and of course I'm traveling business class or first class, right? That matters too as well, by the way. Um, the airport security will generally be less invasive uh, to you, right? Number one. And at the same time, now in, in, when I came back from Singapore this time, uh, no, when I was going, I was asking, okay, no, no, no you're right, sorry, I'm coming back and Singapore Changi Airport, I was like, do you want me to take my watch off? Because if they said yes, what I always do is I take my watch off, I put it into either an AP box or a paddock box, check my video on the boxes I have. I might update that because I've got a few more now. Um, put in one of those and I put it in my checked luggage, I zip it up and I put at least two different uh, Tumi uh, TSA padlocks. I don't have any on my, hang on, hang on, I have one right here, hold on. There we go, I have a padlock right here and I want to show it to you because I just picked up a set of three. Right? Oh, one second. Let me get off this. One moment, I need to. Wow, I got a very heavy camera bag right here. Wow. And very many to unlock the combination. Because this is how I traveled, by the way. So now, all of my previous trips, I traveled as, as I would say, more like a businessman, right? So I have a full leather to me bag. Which is the bag I bought ages ago to go to go to Basel World for the very first time, and I've had that since then, right? So this is one of the padlocks I bought in uh, Singapore, and what you can see is it has the the pin to set it, and it has a TSL lock, right? Um, keep extras of these, get a, get a good brand, uh, Swiss, Swiss Army is a very good one, Swiss Army Knife, right, or the Tumi, uh, these are fantastic. Um, the, I have traveled for the last 20 plus years, or even 25 years, and these have been through the worst airports in the world, right. I've had my bag literally being dropped, like, five meters off, off a conveyor belt, a guy takes the bag and just shoves them across, and these survive, right. So keep a few of these. Practice OCD. It, it might when I'm traveling, and this is nothing, guys. Nobody knows. None of my watches are insured, right? I haven't insured any of my watches since I left England, and the reason for that is in the part of the world where I am right now, it's not easy to insure watches, especially. And I have a friend who lives in Hong Kong, and he told the same thing. Some countries aren't geared to have insurance the way Americans are used to because in America you get what's called your or even in England you get your, like your house general insurance then you have a content insurance you can add a rider to your policy like a jewelry insurance you can have a international travel insurance rider etc and so that's how the western world works here my home is an insurance like this house right here right it's over 80 years old, but been renovated. But my point is, I don't have fire insurance. I have no insurance on this house. None of the houses in, and I'm living in a very posh neighborhood. Nobody insures their homes here. Um, and it's, yeah, it's crazy. Uh, and if I were to, there's one company that I reached out before, and I've said, look, I've got this watch, I'll insure it. And they're like, first of all, they have difficulty coming back. And when they do, the amount of money they want to insure it is uh, maybe the cost of another product. And they want me to pay that every year, right? Um, that just makes no sense. So the approach I take is when I'm traveling to be very, very diligent. And that means to, yeah, be a little bit nutty, right? So my bag will have like maybe six of these two me's all over. Um, and especially the process is I'm in the lounge as I leave the lounge, what I do is I first pack my watch in and I'll lock it up and then I will hold my bag and go to the security uh, check-in, the, the way you get scanned, right? And then at that point, 
if they you know want anything else like they want to take a laptop up, be ready for all this stuff red laptops your power packs battery packs all that stuff be prepared to be harassed uh, take your shoes off and etc the whole rigmarole but make sure your check lug your hand luggage is fully fully locked um, let it go and what you should do is try and delay them uh, no never do that yeah never hand the watch to security you don't need to you can just say sorry no I don't want to get scratched um, let me put it into my bag right they, they can't tell you you can't do that right put it in your bag or put your bag before you even get there even safer and then um, so what you can do is try and put your laptop and stuff in front of your bag so it kind of delays it going through the x-ray machine so by the time you walk through and they've kind of like you know got you to wave your arms about and flail about right first what's going to come out is going to be your, your coat maybe your your passport your, all that stuff your shoes your whatever and what the laptop yeah and then it's going to be you see your bag is going to be more or less inside the thing so the point is you want to move through the the the, the, the x-ray thing and be out while your bag is inside so that nobody from the other side can like put the hand in and do something crazy i know i've overthought this hundred times but it is a risk right i've got easily over hundred thousand us dollars sometimes in my hand luggage in watches um and yeah so i'm very careful and then as soon as i come on the other end i'll sit down if there's a sit down if not i'll open and boom watch on the left wrist if i've taken two watches one on the right wrist French cuffs, so no problem. Put my coat back on, and off I go. Um, if I'm taking three watches, I'll keep one in there. Um, but yeah, in, in the airports, you don't have to always listen to these staff, but be polite and, and try and tell them, look, um, this is expensive or whatever, and put it in your bag. You're thinking, sure, it's a massive risk, but I've been doing this now for what, 25? Wait, I'm I'm just I just turned 25, so wow, yeah, <laughs> getting old. But I've been doing it for about 20 odd years now. Um, so when I was in uni, I started off with Omega and Rolex, and so even though those watches were low value, I've been traveling this identical way. Even as a university student, um, I would travel from Heathrow to Colombo regularly, um, and I would have my GM. I had the GMT two tone. Yellow gold. Uh, when I was in London, uh, that was I think for 2008. I had it for about a year. That's one watch that I sold. And then the following year, I made like 500 quid profit, which is crazy. Um, when I started out, my first collection. So I'll, I'll tell you about my first collection when I started out on Omega, at least, right? Uh, I won't go very far back because I got Omegas from my parents. But yes, my first watch was a Bond Seamaster. Um, it was a Bond Seamaster. Um, no, let me go back. The first one was the Omega Chronograph with the Valju movement, seven seven whatever I can't remember. And then the next one was the Bond, the classic Bond Seamaster. So I had two um, for a while, and then I got very much sucked into Speedmasters. Um, so what happened there was I got in two thousand seven. I know that, at that time, I'm still a university student, by the way, guys. So, um, all the stuff I bought at this point was by doing side gigs, programming, helping companies with websites and stuff. Right, 7750. That's the one. Thank you. And um, my mom, she bought me my first Speedmaster. So, that's the one I have right now. And luckily, it's on my desk. So, this is the one. This is the first one. And this is an interesting story. This is the Omega Speedmaster. Oh, that's webcam. Sorry, guys. Ah, you go higher up. There we go. So this is the Moonwatch, what's called a Sapphire Sandwich. Uh, I'm going to give you the point of the webcam. And as you can see, it's got the Sapphire back. Can I get focus better? It's a 1080p feed. Um, I'm hoping to upgrade my setup to a 4K feed. And when that happens, trust me, guys, I'm going to have a dedicated, like, camera looking point down and I can hold my piece on the desk and you'll have perfect wonderful video right uh, it's not running at the moment because I haven't wound it so bear with me I'm gonna like I, it's gonna be tough to wind this so I'm gonna wind off screen one second 
and just uh, play it run. And so while I'm running, I'm going to tell you the story. So I got to know first as a gift from my mom, on another trip in, in Singapore. And that like really started the kick. Right. I fell in love with Speed, speed Master of the History. I've always been a space geek. I've followed NASA. Now I follow SpaceX like to death. Um, how, how do you know that? Have I told that before? <laughs> wow, yeah, that, that, yeah, exactly. I sold this to my friend. Jim Moose, I think? Yeah, Jim, Jim, Jim Swales, Jim Moose. He was on the time zone for him. Awesome, awesome guy. Um, I think I bought a second uh, watch from him. And then later on, I was like, look, I'm looking to sell this at some point. And then he bought it off me. And then later I was like, hey, can I, okay, I like it back. And he sold it back to me. So, um, and he was a very kind guy. He sold it back to me at cost. Like, uh, he's a wonderful chap. And yeah, so I got this and I got the second one from him. And so then, then my, my idea for collecting was I wanted to have, right? And I'm actually going to go, go back into this. This was really cool. It just that at the time, things changed for me. I was a university student and I was traveling a lot. And yeah, I didn't have time to take care of the collection. But now I'm more more settled and I want to get back to this. So the premise there was I want to collect different movements. So you have this is a certain modern one, then you can go to like a 92, you can go for a 93, and then I actually even had a Cal 321 from, you know, when Aldrin uh, did the whole landing. Um, do you prefer well, it's two different breeds, right? Seamaster is more the dive side, Speedmaster is more the uh, space side, but I'm a huge Chrono fan. So I would say hands down, I'm a fan of this. And also I'm a fan of this Lemania based design. Because it's a column wheel chronograph, right? Um, it's not a, not a Daytona, it's not all that, but still a pretty good column wheel chronograph, but it's not a clutch. Base camera. That's the difference, right? It's not clutch. It's basically two gears that come and the teeth just mesh. So when you start when you start the the timer on this, you can see there's a certain jaggedness when the when the teeth fall together. Whereas the clutch is a, is a clutch mechanism. Where you have the pressure this way and just hold it, and that's the difference between a Daytona or a, you know a higher level Chrono, even the I would believe the FPGA movement in AP, I need to double check. Um, so it's not so much preference, it's like if you like a dive watch, get a Seamaster, get a Planned Ocean. Um, and if, that's, if you want to stay in the Omega camp. But um, I would say right now my tastes are way more on the AP side. So if I was going to get a dive watch, I'll be looking at... That's an interesting question. Well, here's a funny thing. Uh, I swim with my g to watch. Um, my diving is limited to a swimming pool. Or the other kitchen sink. I made it with the chronograph hands of the audition back with you. Right. So, no, but it's the same thing as what I had on my palette, right? So, unfortunately, I can't show it you on this directly. But, uh, can I do it? Because on this, oh yeah, I, I think I might be able to. Um, hang on, bear with me. I'm going to get a toothpick. I have one somewhere on the desk. I use it to reset my routers, not to pick my teeth, <laughs> by the way, but, uh, okay, no toothpick. So I'm going to use the only thing I have right here. I'm going to use a, a, a knife, so don't get, don't freak out. So I got a spider coat, um, but that's not shiny enough, sorry guys. I need to basically point at the sapphire crystal in the same way. Okay, I have one over here, one moment. One moment, I can do this. So, so just to go back, it's similar to my to my paddock. How uh, the the hands right for the chrono are attached to a, uh, a disc, which is again like a cam. So it's like a uh, what do you call it? A pear shaped disc, and the side of it has a flat side. So when you reset the memory and you wind some, by the way, sorry guys, one moment. Is it running? Okay, it's running. So let me see if I can show this to you while it's running. So. Right now, the watch is not running. Oh, it's running, but the chrono isn't. So I'm going to start the chrono. Right, it's running now. But where is the thingy? Bob. Ah! This is so hard, sorry guys. 
Can you see it moving? Right, it's running, right? So what happens now on this side, I'm going to try to remember the order correctly. Can I pull it properly? Here we go. Uh, too much reflection glare, sorry. This is not very easy. But, let me try to see if I can do this. There's basically two hammers here, right? When you hit stop, the two hammers put pressure on that pear-shaped disc. And they have to touch that flat side. That's the short version, really. And the flat side is what the watchmaker has to, when he's fitting it, when he's fitting the dial, hands to the dial, he has to put it manually and synchronize, meaning he has to make sure the watch is in the reset process, like he has stopped the move, stopped the watch, right? So you stop the watch, right? And then you reset it, more or less, right? And then he would then affix the hands to the stem. So what's happened with your hand, I guess, if you had that, is that it's come a bit loose. So your watchmaker would essentially just take it off and reset it. Um, so I'm sorry, sorry I'm just not equipped to give you a more visual explanation right now. But I'm working on moving my entire setup to a dedicated space downstairs and um, I am designing the whole thing with YouTube in mind, so it's going to be, I'm going to really up, up my production quality. I will be hiring a chap to do all the video work, help me with everything I've been doing so on my own, right? So it's going to be, so YouTube is going to be a big part of my week. Uh, it's because I really enjoy making these videos. Um, and not only the watch stuff, but the tech stuff as well. And that's a crazy thing. So what I noticed was my channel, the thing is, most of you guys join my channel for interest in watches and pens. But then I do stuff like the Threadripper box with 32 cores and the watch and friend, uh, pound and found friend fans, which are awesome, thank you, don't really care much about that stuff. <laughs> so, oh, and, and that's the Pare cap I got, uh, what I call the Ed Sheeran cap um, from Pare. Um, and yeah, so I guess from from you guys who who the, the four wonderful souls on my on my stream at the moment, do you think you would prefer to see me move my tech interest to a different channel and keep this purely watch and pen base, or do you don't really mind that I'm doing the tech stuff and the watch stuff and and my general you know lifestyle and interests that kind of thing. Let me know what you think, because it, it but the thing is, I feel that my channel doesn't have much of a direction, and that's kind of intentional, um, in the sense, ooh, wow, right, that's interesting. So, so you guys pretty much just care about the watch and pencil, got it, got it, that's interesting, thank you. But it's kind of hard to get this feedback when, uh, right now you can see, I, I have thousands of them, only five people are online, you know? Um, so it's really cool. Thank you for that feedback. Um, that helps me a lot. So I will do my best to shift that stuff uh, moving forwards into another category if possible. Now that's going to be tricky though because uh, going back to what I said at the start of the stream. So um, TJ Vendor, hi there. I don't think you were here earlier. Uh, YouTube has changed their policies, right? Um, if you need to have thousand subscribers. And in your previous year, you need to accumulate a minimum of 4,000 hours of watched video time. Cumulative. That's like well over 200 and something thousand um, minutes. And I checked my 2017 stats, and I've done about 4,300 hours, right? So the tricky part of me moving my tech stuff in a new channel is um, I won't be supported, right? And as you guys have seen, I've never really asked anybody for money um, and stuff. I've only, I, I tried it in a weird way with the Ethereum mining thing. Uh, I thought people would, you know, feel, feel it's cool to get on the Bitcoin thing and just like, you know. but that is just for kicks. And, but I've never said, you know, I've got a Patreon or like, I'm like a pro YouTuber who's like living off the channel, right? 
but at the same time, I do get a wee bit of funds uh, per year. Um, and I'll be frank with you guys, right now, I think last year I got about 80 US. But come on, 80 US is nothing, right, technically. But on the other hand, right, 80 US can pay for uh, what? An EC2 instance in AWS, right? So I can run a server and do something with it. So thank you guys. And actually, I don't, I don't know if anybody recalls when I got a thousand uh, thousand subs, I had a competition and I said I was going to give something away and I did. I sent, uh, I bought a new strap on Amazon and I gifted it to a guy who um, was part of the, the glance thingy bob and he was the one, the kind of the, the one who was picked from the raffle. Uh, he was a very young chap. Um, and my intent there was to try and get him to come on the channel and kind of share his interest, what he got into. But what was surprising was he didn't want any exposure. So I kind of forgot to follow up with the group, with all, all my viewers about that. So people may think I never um, followed through with my commitment. And I basically spent the $80 um, or part of it. Um, maybe about 50 bucks um, on the on the item I sent. It was actually a watch strap. It was a watch strap. It was, it was leather. It was something similar quality as this. Um, and this is a really, really wonderful strap. I have a whole video on this one. This is the uh, Colorab Vero Pelle Merita in Italy. Sorry, I'm going all Italiano with the spaghetti and the bolognese. No, 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 no. Mamma mia, you know? <laughs> Sorry, I do, I do, I do crazy voices. I can do, I can do an Indian guy, I can, you know, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, trust me, I have spent $200 on handmade custom ones. I have spent $500 on alligator omega straps. Uh, up to date, I haven't had to buy a product strap. They keep giving them to me for free. So I have no idea what that costs. But, this color rib, Italian strap, is like under, oh you want to hear it, oh my god, Indian guy, oh my gosh, so my mother made, no, i sorry I guys, I can't do it, I'm laughing, oh, I, I, give me some time, I'll try to get an Indian guy mode, <laughs> oh, that's a crazy, um, <laughs> I was trying to go like a Mindaloo and uh, upper down, <laughs> no, it's not going to work, uh, but yeah, so this strap is like, uh, $40 on Amazon, I think. I got on eBay. They, they have a store on eBay and they have a store on Amazon. And I found the lady, she's like the daughter of this family. She's a Rebischini, I think. So the color Reb, the R-E-B is like the last name. It's pretty cool. Um, they make all this stuff. Uh, and for $40, this is like incredible. I mean, to be honest, Hodinki sells, you know, leather straps, $200 plus. Dollars. I would wager this is, oh boy, I'm sorry, the webcam. This is pretty good because what I see is like the, the burnishing is pretty great. It's soft, the stitching is nice. Uh, it hasn't cracked, right? It's been on my, I've had this now for almost half a year. Uh, I'm totally impressed with this. Um, yeah. It is, it is really quite good. So if I need another strap for anything, I'll just buy the same brand. A total total value for money. Um, yeah. So let me see where are we? So we've done about forty. We can come to forty five minutes. Um, do you guys have any other questions? Let's say with traveling, with traveling with watches, uh, maintenance and care, or any other random questions um, that you have for me? I'll be around. I think for the next fifteen minutes. I really appreciate that. At least a few of you. Uh, came on. Oh, okay. Let me let me put in the, let me put a link in the in the comments uh, into into the chat stream. Let me find it exactly. It's called Color Red. It's called uh, Red. Let me find it. One moment, guys. Uh, so Color Red strap. Um, oh, here we go. Found it. I'm going to put a link directly to their shop. But I bought it. Bought mine on uh, eBay or Amazon. Wow. 
that's a nice shop. So here we go. Here's the link. So by the way, guys, I, I'm not associated. I get no money from this. Um, and I'm just a fan of their product, right? Similarly, there are other products I've bought, and I'm just enthusiastic or a fan of it. So uh, let me try Amazon. Colorado. What's it called? Vera, Vera Pelle, what's it called? Vera Pelle. Okay. Vera Pelle. Let's try that. So, uh, Vera Pelle, no, to, 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 to color it, here we go. Um, oh, that's on Pinterest. New, not the Pinterest. Let's try eBay. Now, I remember I got it on eBay then. eBay. Let's try this one, color eBay store. Oh, here we go. I found e they have an eBay store, and they're very good. Uh, here we go. And I must say, the, the way it arrives as well, the co I didn't expect to receive that kind of uh, packaging. Um, done very tastefully. And, um, oh yeah, so I have a friend who lives in Fort Mill, South Carolina. He's uh, in the aviation industry, and he's a watch guy. I've never met him. But I've been speaking with him for the last 10, 15 years. Uh, and our connect is about watches. I mean, that's what brought us together. And his birthday came up. And I want to do something nice for him. Um, Amazon would let me send wine. Uh, it is weird. If you pick a bottle of wine, it only lets you send it to certain states. And I, I, I like to send a French bottle of wine. Not, I, I'm not a big fan of Australian or stuff, that kind of stuff. But well, my taste are pretty much French. Um, and so I was like, okay, I can't send a bottle of wine. I want to do something watch oriented. And uh, yeah, because that's what he's into as well. And I sent him one of these straps. And I think he's been loving it so far. Um, because his brother gifted him a pretty cool watch. And by mistake, in my, in my excitement, I should have sent a 20 mm lug one. I sent him an 18. But then luckily the watch he got from his brother uh, was a vintage one, meaning it was it's tiny, a bit more petite, and the agent was like perfect for that. So rather than having to swap it out, I told him you can swap it out, uh, he didn't need to. That kind of worked out quite well. So guys, for the next few minutes, I just want to show you something because I haven't mentioned it on my channel yet. I'm going to do some reviews on it, and uh, I hope you guys in photography because this is going to impact the channel as well. So on my trip to Singapore, I bought this bad boy. So, what is this? Forget the lens for the moment. This is the Sony A7R3, um, which a lot of people in the photography space consider to be really, really cool because it's a 4K camera, it's a micro four thirds, there is no prism, it does focus speaking, it's got an EVF. Um, it can shoot at 10 frames per second, you can do 10 frames per second silently. It takes really, really fast, really, really fast, whoops, cards. So this can take, let me see, pull one out, I only have one in here, where's that card off to? That's crazy. Oh, it's on this, wow. I've got a 64 gig G grid, so it's a read at 300 megs, write at two, uh, 300 megs. Um, whoops, hang on, there you go. That's the card, right? Um, and so this is like a direct competitor if you're into cameras, uh, which is, hang on, the right way, the uh, Nikon D500, which I have. And that's, that's like my go to wildlife uh, camera. That is 10 frames per second. It's got XQD, uh, which is very fast storage. So this storage is as fast or faster, right? Um, and what's really cool here is I've gone for a vintage setup, right? I am not, hello Asad, hi there, welcome. I'm not running a Sony G Master lens, I would love to at some point, but I'm running what? I'm running a Zeiss Distagon, which is the, the design. Um, this is a 35 millimeter F2. So hang on, sorry, my, my window is being blocked by another YouTube window, so. I can't see my feet, I'm so sorry about that one second. Oh, here we go. So, back up we go. I need to hold this the right way. So, there, let's see if you can see this. So, 
So this part here is the the ring that you change to select the F stop. There you go. I'm rotating it. I'm going from F two to F two point eight, F four like that. Um, and now this lens is actually the device is called it's called the ZF two mount. Uh, the ZF dot two mount. Uh, what it means is a uh, Nikon mounts are um, F mount. The ZF dot two means there is circuitry or contacts right on the manual lens that will send back info to the Nikon body, and this works on my D five hundred. On my D five hundred, I can have this lens on and I can control the aperture from the back dial. On this one, I cannot because I'm using what's called here we go. This fellow is called a Metabones adapter, right? Oh, we have this thing. So this is just a spacer, and that's the cool part. This is just a hollow disc with the mounts on either side. So it's got Sony E mount on this side and Nikon F mount on this side. And this is the cheapest one. There's a higher grade called Speed Booster, which is pretty incredible because it does magic stuff with light and gives you one more stop. Uh, in, in photo geeky terms, yeah, it, it, you need to look what that means. What it means, uh, it's crazy how it does it. So this is like about, I think, about hundred bucks, and the magic version is about like five hundred bucks. I didn't need the speed booster because this is crazy. So let me demo. You can see what my room is like, right? Let me go on, and I'm going to take the cap off, and I'm going to show you what the thing sees when I point behind the room. This is going to be crazy. Uh, let me put it F. Okay, F two point eight, and let me try and turn it around. So what you see? Oops, not my face. Ah, I'm trying to show it to you guys in some sensible way. Okay, that orientation and webcams that way. You can see how it's like. Yeah, it's totally. Okay, I'm pointing at back. So. It's kind of hard to show from this, and I will do a proper review. What I'm trying to basically say is, if this room is lights out, this thing shows me stuff in the room that I can't see. It's incredibly amazing how it can do that, first of all. And number two, you see the exposure as the exposure that's going to be recording on, on your, in your offer. Whereas on a DSLR, you don't see that. What you do is, you basically prepare your shot, you take your shot, and then you have to chimp. You have to double check that the exposure exposure is right. You have to check the histogram, really. On this, I don't need to check the histogram, because what I see on the LCD or through the EVF is what I'm going to get. So all so my process right now for this thing, this manual setup is pretty cool. All I do is lock on target, right? I enable the focus peaking, which means it does this magical yellow color, you can change the color on where the, where the plane of focus is. Set focus, shoot. That's all I have to do. It's crazy. And what's even cool with this, I'm very much into the vintage style. Um, check this out. Dedicated exposure comp wheel. Where is it? Uh, the last one, this one. That's just crazy. So it's like I'm using a camera that's from 1960s. But this is like the most advanced uh, and popular one out there right now, uh, and it's giving the D five hundred run for its money. It's probably even running loops. I mean, this is this is the one that people, I myself, was comparing with the D eight fifty by Nikon. Um, I'm I'm still probably going to get buy the D eight fifty as well, because while this is awesome, I wouldn't consider it to be a rugged camera because I had the D eight ten. And one day I dropped it. I dropped it from about yay high. It hit something, hit my knee, and hit my and then it hit the floor. Um, and I probably had this lens on, oh, this some other lens. And luckily the lens didn't hit the floor. It was the body, like the bottom of that one. I feel that this camera, if this were to fall, it's the end of it. It's techn technologically amazing. But it doesn't have that rugged uh, build quality that Nikon or Canon have. Um, so, like, there is a reason why 
you have the, the D5, etc. Um, so if you're in the extreme, right, you're maybe going like like Matt Granger, you're going to Iceland, you're going to these crazy harsh conditions, and then you're taking photo photographs that you really can't miss. Uh, that's your job, or you're shooting for time when you're going to like a war zone, right? Uh, you, I don't know. I don't think you'll be taking this. You might, you, you might carry this, but you won't use it in that moment. Um, you might use it for when you are in a more safer area. Uh, so this I like because this is great for a tourist, and most of the time I'm a tourist for street photography, for shooting at restaurants. Um, but I do love my, you know, good food uh, from sushi, sashimi, you know, fondue, all that. Uh, love my steak, uh, medium rare, and uh, yeah, and that's the other thing. Taking this into a restaurant doesn't look as intimidating, and if I put the 50 millimeter on, it that lens is like this. Yeah, yeah it's like yeah, that much. It's not. It's not. It's so much smaller. This is so. It's not gonna scare people around. Whereas if I would take the D500, I'm carrying that. Uh, body and 7200 and it's like you're carrying a gun and straight away people think, oh you're a professional can you take a photograph of us? and I, I, I know I'm blind of course but um, just when you carry it around people think that you're like pro pro talk um, so yeah guys this is pretty cool I'll be doing a full review on this uh, bear with me I've got some very hectic stuff happening, happening this week but by next weekend I'm going to be dropping a whole lot more videos from my Singapore trip, my time at Paddock, um, videos of me collecting the Paddock, um, and then I did something foolish-ish here and I ended up packing it and putting it back in the safe for safety reasons. <laughs> uh, yeah, let's, let's, let's put it that way. Um, Colombo has changed to, to a degree I never thought because Ages, I mean, before the week I had last week, I would jump what's what's called a tuk tuk or in the, uh, uh, what's it called, a rickshaw in, in Bangkok, right? I would just be on those and I have my paddock on. I'm in jeans, you know, nobody cares really. Um, I'm, I'm, I walk around with this gold bracelet, a gold chain, a very slim one. Nobody really cares as such. If you're in the right area, if you're in the wrong area, they'll 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 take your neck for this, right? But I'm usually in the hotel, like I'm in Hilton or the Shangri-La. I, I I only move to very few places. But within in, in the hotel communities, I never expected the hotel staff here to know what Pare is. But what happened was the Shangri-La just opened in Colombo. Brand spanking new hotel. Beautiful, um, and I got the Palak biography book, right? I bought it at the, uh, at the service center. This is a huge book. It's uh, yeah, I've been to parts of the world. Uh, I went went once. Um, I think it was ninety eight, if I'm not mistaken. Was that was the year the the five one four six was out, and I was there in front of the glass looking at the five one four six. I got the catalog for the 5146, and that's all what Patek was talking about that year. And it's the watch that resonates the most with me. Um, and I always felt my goal was going to be an annual calendar. Um, simple reason for this, right? Cost is a point, and practicality. In a sense, if you get a perpetual calendar, awesome. But think about it, you still service it every five years. So that means technically, <sighs> You will only get to wear it depending on where the leap year falls. Okay, for the five year period, but the whole perpetual point is not really perpetual. You have to service it every five years. It's not like you can wear it for 100 years at a certain time. I didn't really 100 years, but this is my point. So, in that sense, the fact that a perpetual is four times the price of an, an annual in, in put it, you know, pricing and all that. Um, it didn't appeal to me at the time, and to be honest, right now, if I'm buying a perpetual calendar, I won't buy a body. I'll buy an AP. Um, the AP perpetual, it's on my list. But just sorry to digress, Baselworld. The reason I went to Baselworld is because 
at the time I was very active on time zone. <laughs> yeah, you're so poverty. Yeah, and, and yeah, we lived like vampires. Uh, like Edward Cullen forever and ever for a thousand years. <laughs> yeah. Um, and what is it? Yeah, so we, so I was very, very much in time zone at that time. And back then, uh, a few people on that time zone Rolex forum became like a close knit. And for whatever reason, I became part of that. Um, and so it's like we became buddies in this forum. And but it got to a point that the people running Time Zone didn't like that because they don't want anything critical or negative about the brand being said on their forum because they are making money off it. So they only want to they are the good. So but we as collectors, right, if we have a problem. We'll say, hey, there's a problem here. Like there's a, a guy, I would say his name, but he bought a 5960P, a holy grail. I love the 5960P. And as he got it, I'm gonna put the camera down for a moment. Um, he worked for a while, right? And then he noticed a big problem. His uh, mate hand is starting to get scratched. Like, you know, you look, you look at it and there's scuff marks that were there before. And then you can test Parek and okay, they do something. What happened was Parek had messed up the design process. The uh, hour hand had a piece of metal that would rub against the main hand. And so what they did was they basically got his watch, they did like a quick hack and they fixed it, right? But to be honest, it's Parek Philip. That should have never happened, right? It should have been designed perfectly from day one. Um, so, while I love some things about the brand, there's a whole lot I don't love about the brand. Um, and, and that should be another video at, at some point. Um, the, the snobbish attitude. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's a pretty sure. I love my 546, but getting another party Philippe, it's, it's a tough call because I feel AP is a far better brand because the people are better, the staff are friendly. If you go to Singapore, they treat you nicely, not because you have money, because they treat you nicely, trust me. Whereas in Singapore, I go to the Parek uh, boutique, the shop at Ion, I'm wearing my Parek cap and there are all these Chinese dudes at the door and they're like very you know, careful to let me in and even once they let me in, they're like, oh, we can't show that watch, or uh, we only have one of this, we don't have that. And they're very stiff, and um, yeah, they, they just judge you in this, as you're coming in. And I personally don't like that. And what my actual way, people don't realize, when I go watch shopping, I go like a tourist. I wear my oldest, tattiest t-shirt, I wear jeans, right? I might do something silly like I'll, I look like I'm like just off the bus, typical, you know, tourist tourist. Like I'm not someone who's gonna buy your watch. I just do that, you know why? I just want to judge the staff. And see what sort of staff work at this organization. And as soon as I get the vibe of snobbery and all that sort of crap, right? It puts me off. Uh, so I bought the five and four six because I love that watch. Not because I love the brand. I love, the, I, I love the history of it, right, where I came from all, sorry, sorry video sense, I'm, I'm, di I'm digressing, but mechanical cost doesn't make sense because I don't you need to change about it. Well, right, fair enough, but, uh, sorry, my, my point for the um, service period was perpetual calendar. So, because the, my point is the perpetual calendar costs four times as much as an annual calendar, and the term perpetual and the fact that it can transition um, up to the leap year, um, sorry, it accounts for leap years as well. Uh, it's all good and fine, but only up to five years because you can get to five years and then you're extending for a service, right? It's not like it it goes on and on and on, the name perpetual kind of thing. Yeah, so, so you're right. Um, so, so when I was shopping, basically, my way to just where I was look, I'm not going to aim for the perpetual. It, it's ridiculous in that sense. I'll just go for the annual calendar, um, and then later look at something that catches my fancy. 
And the one that caught, caught my fancy was this, the AP Royal Oak. And I love this watch to death, right? This is my first AP. Uh, I should not take it off, sorry. I need to tweak my uh, webcam. So actually, give me one moment, guys. I'm going to shift this down because, sorry, once this is causing a lot of uh, friction where to point up at the screen. I've got a 43 inch 4K display, so let me see if this works instead. Whoops, whoa, <laughs> that's terrible. Okay, let's see if I can mount this in any bit. Oh, let, let, let's, let's hand hold it, sorry. Okay, let's see if I can do it this way. There we go, that's better. So now you get to see the AP in a bit more, whoops, there we go. Now I'm gonna an angle right. Um, detail, and what I love about this watch, look at the light. I only got two light sources here. If you go into like a place where it's like five or 10 lights, this thing is like a, like a chandelier. And it's, look, I've had this since 2011. I've worn it almost at least 12 hours of every day. This has been on my wrist. Um, I use soldering irons, I clean the dishes, I do my own electrical wiring. Um, I, I don't do housework as such, in the sense I don't sweep or, I used to use a Dyson, right? Um, I'm pretty hands on, I do all my like electrical stuff, I do all my Cat5 cabling. Um, but, sorry, I'm gonna put the, put the webcam back up here because this is getting, there we go. Right, and uh, let me adjust this thingy bob. Okay, and yeah, um, it's fine. I mean, it's still shiny, shiny, shiny. Uh, so what happened was recently, it's the buckle here, this thing, would just pop open with no no pressure. So I had my aunt. Um, she 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 lives in Switzerland, so she travels up and down between Palermo and Switzerland pretty often. So I just gave it to her and said, "Please do you mind just go on. Give it to the body uh, plus the la history of Ruderon." And in like five ten minutes, they um, tighten now. It's like super super, super tight. So thank you guys. It's been an hour. It's I've it's been I've done it from three a.m. to four sixteen a.m. Sunday in Sri Lankan time. Um, I haven't even checked to see what time it is for you guys. Are you guys from the, the Pacific or the East Coast? Where are you guys? If you don't mind me asking. I'm trying to check what PST time is now. So PST is woo. Right, almost 5 five p.m. PST and almost 6 p.m. Eastern. Wow, cool. So it's, yeah, almost 4, 4 a.m. 17 minutes past. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, because I work in Sing. I work to PST. The, the, the company, I, my main company that I work with is located in, in San Francisco. So uh, during the work week, I work midnight to 8 a.m. and the, the the bad thing about that is I drink a lot of coffee, a lot of Nespresso and recently the, the caffeine intake has, has been affecting me pretty badly and I only discovered that this week and so this I've now stopped taking uh, drinking as much Nespresso because I need to really detox um, but as you can see my sleep cycle is everywhere. I should have gone to sleep, what, four hours ago? Just couldn't, so I said, talk. but I'm gonna do a live stream and see if anybody comes on, you know, I've never done it before. So, thank you to you guys for joining. Um, it means everything that actually three people took the time to come on the live stream, which I thought was like, I'll be talking to a blank screen for like 30 minutes and just kill the stream, so, thank you. Um, so please, if you have any questions, feel free to comment in any of the videos. I'll do my best to get back to you guys. Um, and yeah, have a, have a good day, have a good Sunday, have a great weekend, and hope you have a, a stress-free Monday. And uh, yeah, take care guys. Thanks for, thanks for watching, and yeah. Um, I, I, I look forward to doing more live streams down the road, but for the time being, I'm just trying to get my 
entire office. This is my, my whole my whole tech stack is here. My entire company is in this row of computers. I've got three or so computers going back and they run the entire business at the moment. And that's not how it should be. <laughs> I'm moving to a professional space. I'm getting professional Dell powered blade servers installed downstairs. I'm doing a 10G network. I'm dropping in multi-mode fiber. It's gonna be crazy awesome. Um, so I'm focusing on all that stuff. Once that's in place and my new workspace, it'll be a mix between a home theater, computing space, uh, right next to the office part and the ele electronics lab, IoT area. Um, there'll be it'll be dedicated uh, YouTube space. So I will have dedicated cameras around. I might end up adding another A7 R3 or an A7. The sorry, the old one, A7R2, just as a as a secondary 4K camera. Um, and yeah, so I plan to push the the quality forward, and give me give me about give me a couple of months, and we'll get there. We'll get there. Thank you. Cheers. Bye. -bye.